What year did you move to Los Angeles? Which time I've... I've uh, early, like I in, the, in the every 80s? Every time I think I'm out, they suck me back in. In the 80s? Yeah, I moved to, out here to go to the Guitar Institute of Technology, Musicians Institute, and I was class of uh, 84 to 85. It used to be a one-year like vocational thing, and back in the day when I went, it was just amazing. Uh, Tommy Tedesco from the Wrecking Crew was still teaching there, Don Mock, Dwayne Deo, Keith Wyatt, Frank and Bali, Scott Henderson, and... It was just an amazing place to be, and it put me out here not only learning from some really serious players, because I didn't really want to do like a rock band or a metal band or whatever. I was I wanted to be more like a would have been happy to do like a Steve Lukather, Larry Carlton kind of session thing. I loved Alan Holsworth, Steve Morse, and all these kind of players. Although I did like Randy Rhodes and and all Warren D. Martini and all these rock players, but I was always more kind of like. You know how people remember Randy, they don't think of like sex, drugs, and rock and roll. They think more like he was really focused on guitar and learning and just being the best guitarist he could be. Then he went out on stage and rocked and rolled and didn't worry about the drinking and the drugs so much. So you're not even into thrash at all, are you, at this point? Mm, I I mean, that was... I, I Into it, I mean, I don't listen to it. I... The last Megadeth album I really checked out was Rust in Peace. You know, I've heard a thing here or there, like when we went to Arizona, he played us some of the, the new album. But, but you know, back when then? the Cookie Monster vocals come in, I'm out. Got to make an exception. I love Pantera, and I, I dig his voice. I think they do it well, and I love Dimebag's playing, so I'll listen to that. But there's just so much music out there. And, and to be honest, when you're playing music all day, it's like if you're a masseuse, the last thing you want to do is go home and massage your... Your boyfriend or your girlfriend, right? Or if you're a doctor, you don't want to be, go to a party and be given medical advice to all your friends. It's by the end of the day when you're working on your own music, you're not listening to a lot of other f- music. That's what was great about the radio show. It's at least one day a week I sat down with all my friends out there in Radio Land and made sure I listened to like the best music I could think of that week that uh, folks wouldn't hear anywhere else. And in 84, when you're there, uh, what's your initial impression of the scene at that time? The week I arrived, I started driving around and I was alone. I didn't know anyone. So I had a roommate who I moved in, who I didn't know, who there was actually a buddy of mine from Dayton who came out to GIT, did the year and came back and he was teaching guitar at the local music store. And I ended up taking his room. So I, and the great thing is that guy's been my buddy ever since. He's one of my best longtime friends. His name's Larry Steen. And I talk to him every week on private message on Facebook. We stay in touch. And, and that, that was a great, beautiful relationship. But I moved out there and the, the very first memory musically that I have, and uh, I'll tie this into a recent audition mentioning that I almost did the Ross thing. Uh, Rat Out of the Cellar had just been released that week, and Rat was making the rounds on the local L.A. radio stations doing interviews. So that was the first time any of us ever heard Round and Round and Back for More and Wanted Man. And and they were playing all the songs because they're doing blocks and interviewing the band. So I, I really enjoyed that. I always have loved Warren D. Martini's playing, and he was, again, another guy that he never had really any drama around him. It was just about playing guitar and doing that the best he could and writing the best songs he could. And I don't think folks really realize what a, a great a compass songwriter he is and how much of Rat's music he's responsible for. But a couple of years back, I did end up auditioning to take his place in Rat. And I was pretty much there in the final two guys to get the gig. And I, I just couldn't do it. And if folks saw what happened when they called it the new breed of rat came out and some videos hit the hit the internet on Blabbermouth and whatnot, they had a pretty messed up singer. And I I'd already had an experience with that in the 80s, and I just knew I couldn't do that again. So those are the tough decisions you make in the music business that, like, you want to do a gig, you get a gig, you know you can do it, but there's extraneous circumstances or reasons why it just it wouldn't be the right thing whether it's you know playing with david lee roth or playing with rat steven piercy was in at that point yeah yeah it's juan and steven 
Did and, you see any of the videos? And I did. They, yeah, I mean, he always has, uh, and I've said it even in many of my interviews where just that shock of when I was a kid, my first concert was Judas Priest and Great White, and they sound exactly like the record. And then I saw somebody else like Dio or something, and they sound, he sounds exactly like the record. And then I saw like Motley Crue and Rat, and I was just like, what in the fuck was that? Why didn't it sound anything like the record? It, the voice mainly. They couldn't replicate it. If you, you know? go on my YouTube, you're going to see, and you can see it's a timeline. I actually don't have any of the Rat audition stuff I did, but you can see when I auditioned for Alcatraz a couple years ago. Like it was right after the rat thing. And that would have been, you know, I would have been replacing Ingve and Steve Vai. And I just, I went through that thing and I did have that gig. But at the last minute, I found out that the singer is lip syncing to a tape. Are you kidding? Wow. The entire show, yeah. I mean, that's like Millie Vanilli and I just couldn't go out and do that to fans. I just, that's, to me, that's not artistry, that's con artistry. So I worked on both those gigs, Rad and Alcatraz. I worked four or five months learning all that stuff note for note. You can go on my YouTube and look at the Bigfoot. And that was my most popular video worldwide was the Bigfoot rehearsals. Uh, it's just the solo section. And then right next to that is a video. I'm there, uh, the singer, and just not mentioning the name, but we all know who the singer in Alcatraz was. And you know, they recently replaced him. Right. But he's just there off camera. Wow. And we're rehearsing there doing the Hiroshima more and more. My YouTube's like a diary of my life. You can kind of see. All right, yeah. And I didn't put it out. I didn't talk about it. I talked about it a little on my radio show. So folks who've listened to that and some of my closest friends, but you know, these are hard, these are hard choices that you got to make. And, you know, as you mentioned, you go to a concert and you hear a singer and it sounds like nothing like the record. Well, when Alcatraz played uh, Las Vegas and I met the manager and got the offer to, to do this gig. He sounded just like the record. It wasn't until a little while later I found out why. <laughs> and you were a fan. I saw something when I was kind of uh, going through stuff is you were a fan in the 80s. You loved Ingve. Oh, of course. Yeah. Listen to the Megadeth album. You can hear the influence. I was a student at GIT. I got to go backstage and hang with Ingve on the Alcatraz No Parole from Rock and Roll Tour one-on-one -on -one, and he was really cool to me. I still have pictures. I posted on social media here and there the pictures when I was hanging with him. He showed me how, you know, how how he held the pick and some details to his technique that I didn't understand just by trying to listen to the record and figure stuff out by ear on half speed, which was all we had back then. <laughs> 